Hi everyone, welcome to The Superficial Spirit, where we explore how pop culture affects our spiritual experiences. My name is Peter Breeze. Join me while we ask a very important question. What the hell did pop culture do to me? Welcome to the Superficial Spirit. Thank you so much for tuning in again, wherever you are. I'm excited to have you here. I'm so grateful that we get to share this time together. And I have a great show for you today. I am so happy that I have this podcast to get me through this crazy ass time that we are living in. And the more I interview people, the more I'm obsessed with this process of discovery that I'm finding with the podcast. Um, It initially started out of boredom. I was at home. I had been laid off and I didn't really know what I was going to do to fill my time. And I wanted to start a YouTube channel, but then I, I just felt like I didn't have all the lights and the cameras to make it look good. Cause it, it is not easy to make at home videos look sleek and expensive. Okay. Um, so I, my boyfriend, Evan actually suggested that I look into podcasts because he loves podcasts. And um, I was happy to discover that they are relatively easy to put together. You know, I don't have an expensive setup. I'm just at home doing my thing, talking to people on Zoom, but it, it has been such a blessing. And I've been connecting with people that I haven't talked to in years, people that were influential in my life, but for whatever reason, I've lost touch with. Um, I've been able to explore my own journey more thoroughly. Um, I love the topics of spirituality and pop culture, and it's been such a blessing to be able to you know, merge those two and explore them even further. And today, I'm talking to somebody who is a part of my journey and Okay, I have the remember that show how to make a murderer. I kind of wanted to take that approach with some of the interviews I have coming up, which is basically how to make a celebrity. And I'm, I'm reaching out to people who are influential in my growth while I was growing up, when I moved to Vancouver, while I was in film school and in the club scene to sort of get some insight into what their perception of, was of me at that time, because I was so sure, I was so, so, so passionate about my dreams and I was so confident that everything was going to work out for me. Um, and I want to know what other people's experience of that was, you know, re- reality is relative. We all experience the same things differently. And I want to connect with people who were influential to me back then to get some insight into what they were observing. And also what what their relationship is with their own dreams. The person I'm talking to today, I'm so excited to have. His name is Bill Marchant. He's a huge, um, he's an acting teacher in Vancouver. He's influenced so many actors in the scene. And I want to talk to him about actors and kids like me who come to film school who just want to be movie stars and how that affects their career and the realities of, you know, being a working performer. And also these ideas of manifesting and anybody can live their dream. Is that actually possible? possible? I don't know. I really believed it did. I really did believe that for a long time. And I still do believe that the power of our mind can influence what we experience in our lives. And I'm curious now to talk to other people about what they think. Um, And he's in a unique position because he deals with people who have big dreams all the time. So without further ado, please welcome Bill Marchant, live from Vancouver. (gasps) Bill! Hello, Peter. How are you? I am fantastic. How are you? I am so excited to be talking to you. You it's look so ex- surreal. You look exactly the same. You do too. And it's been what I, I haven't seen you in over ten years. I'm assuming. Yeah, I think yeah. it was. I graduated Vancouver Film School in I don't know 2007. Six? Really, that long? Wow. I think so. I think no, it's crazy. <laughs> And you're in Toronto? I'm in Toronto now, yeah. How yeah. long have you been here? I've been here for about three years. I just passed my three-year mark. Yep. It's a, a big gray city. It is a big gray city, yeah. <laughs> and it's, well, you know, in the wintertime, it's not much fun. 
No, but you know, I grew up in Alberta, so I'm used to the cold. And honestly, I kind of miss the snow living in Vancouver. Like when I look back at Vancouver, I feel like I was never too hot or too cold. I was just like always cool, always comfortable. Yeah, 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 that's true. Um, Why did you move to Toronto? So my boyfriend, Evan, had some health issues, actually. And we were kind of toying with the idea because he was from Toronto originally. And he has family here. And we were all, because we lived in Kelowna, and we were like, should we go to Toronto? Should we not? And he came out here to get some tests. And then he kind of took a dip. And we had to make a quick decision. And we came and we didn't leave. So He's doing better now, thankfully, but definitely wasn't where I thought I was going to end up because we were living in Kelowna and I, I was so, when I left Vancouver, I was really ready to like approach life completely differently. Like yeah. no city. I wanted to be quiet. I wanted to go walk in the mountains. I didn't want to party anymore. Can you imagine? You know, no. To- <laughs> <laughs> I know. So it, it wasn't expected to come here. But now after three years, I'm starting to get into the groove. You know, I do like the hustle and the energy of the city, but yeah. I definitely, it wasn't, it wasn't on my radar. It's not where I thought I would be. Yeah. I lived there for four years and uh, when I was a young actor and uh, apart from how challenging that was, uh, I did. I love the city. I, I, it's, it's when I first moved to Vancouver, uh, cause I grew up in Ontario. Just, I, in, in, do you know where Georgetown is? No. Do you know where Brampton is? Yes. 10 minutes. Well, it used to be a 10 minute drive. Now it's a 40 minute drive from Brampton. Um, uh, just traffic. Um, but, um, yeah, when I first moved to Vancouver, people would literally stop me on the street and say, slow down. And I'm like, well, this is, <laughs> this is Toronto speed, you know? And, and I've heard of Vancouverites uh, going to Toronto. Uh, excuse me. And um, uh, and having the opposite reaction, you know, like yeah, yeah. just yeah. And when and when I first moved here, I couldn't believe how how, how calm and placid and slow it was comp- compared to Toronto. Yeah. You know what's so crazy is when I moved to Vancouver from Calgary, I thought Vancouver. When people used to call Vancouver no fun city, I could not believe that that was their experience because coming from Calgary, I thought Vancouver was like New York or LA. I just, it was so big. (laughs) There were so many people. And now that I'm in Toronto, I, oh my God, I don't know how, I don't know if I would have survived Toronto or Montreal if I would have come, you know, in my early twenties, because I was so hungry for that crazy experience. And Toronto just has that times 10. So I'm kind of grateful that I, I, you know, worked my way up to Toronto. When, when I was a young Peter Breeze, uh, Toronto was definitely a, a dangerous place for me to be. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I didn't have the success that, that you had here in Vancouver. Like it, Toronto was just a, a dead end for me. I couldn't get an agent. I did a little bit of theater, but um, you know, it was, yeah. Yeah. It just, it, it was, a, it was, a, I, I love Toronto, but it's a, it's a tough city. Yeah, it wow. is. It is. I'm grateful that I have Evan and that I'm not attached to the club scene anymore because I can just imagine how alienating and distracting it would be to have so many more things to just sort of keep you off track from what you want to do. I'm definitely, now is the time for me to be here for sure, but um, I can only imagine being younger. So we know each other from Vancouver Film School and you you have had a long and great career in acting. How did you get involved in VFS? Because when I met you there, you were like this bright, shining star, very intimidating. I was like, wow, this guy's got so much together. And you you had this ability to read people, which kind of freaked me out. But I want to know how you ended up at the school. Um, wow. Okay. Um, so the truth of it is that uh, I, I had done a play uh, with this woman by the name of Catherine Billings. Was Catherine there when you were there? I don't I think, think so. She, was she still there? She, that was around the time she left. Anyway. Um, and she was an American and she came up and directed me in this play. And then when the play was over, she wanted to stay in Canada for the health care because she, she had trouble with her hips, et cetera. And she had no health care in the States. So VFS offered her the job to take over the department, which was very tiny at that point in time. It was like two rooms. We had, you know, one camera, one TV, four, three teachers at that time. And I said no, wow. because, because the, the school didn't, the, the school had a great reputation, but the acting department w- had no reputation. It was, it was an embarrassment. And Catherine said to me, well, what if, what if you got to 
you know, help decide the curriculum so that you could create the acting school that you wanted to go to. Because I went to theater school because there was no film school. So um, uh, 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 anyway, so she, with that kind of an offer, I couldn't say no. So that was when we added all the audition classes, all the biz classes, um, all the camera classes. Before then, it was a traditional acting school, more conservative, conservatory style. And I wanted it to be more method-based, more modern, more camera-based. Because I, I, I love theater, but I was always a film buff and wanted to be in film. So in, instead of being an acting school, it was a, a, an acting school for film and television. Um, and within a year, we had completely revamped and changed the whole curriculum. Uh, the original groups were yellows and blues and greens, and then we changed it to the number system. So the first class to get the real full curriculum that you got was class four, um, which was in my second year there. And um, I, I told Catherine at the time that I'd stay for a year or two, and now I've been there for 23 years. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy how you weren't, because I feel like your art, your artistic journey as an actor was one thing, and then this opportunity came up to be part of creating this great educational experience for these young actors, but not, not on your radar at all. So yeah. what was that like for you to shift your focus from you know, being a working actor and, and doing your own thing to suddenly helping other people get to that point? Um, I had, I'd already started my own school. I ran a, a, um, a theater company slash school called The Company We Keep with a, wo a woman by the name of Kate Twa who went on to run the Lyric School of Acting and then Railtown School here in, in Vancouver. Uh, she worked at VFS for a time too, but didn't, uh, she did not gel with Catherine, my boss, so she took off and started her own school. But I'd, I'd already been doing that for at least five years before I started at VFS. And you, I mean, you know, you've, you've been in the room with me. I, my greatest passion in life is for writing, uh, believe it or not. That's, that's my, that's my, makes my heart beat. Um, but after that, uh, uh, I enjoy the, the time in the classroom as much as I do the time on set. Um, I, I always say to the students that uh, there are three places I'm, I'm, I'm the happiest in, in my life. Uh, one is on set. Uh, uh, two is uh, alone with a blank piece of paper. And number three is in the loving arms of my husband. So. Oh, uh, my God. <laughs> That's so nice. I love that. And you, you have that passion. It was obvious that you loved what you did. Um, and like I said, when I got to VFS, it was the first decision I made, I think, to... I say there's two pivotal things that happen. Well, there's a lot of pivotal things, but like going to a nightclub was huge for me because I was like, this is a place I can thrive in. And then yes. going to VFS was where I took all of the things I did experimentally and socially in the club, you know, creating an image for myself, um, pushing that forward, and then trying to get that in into a structure of acting. And going to acting, like going to film school that year was, I, I can't say enough good things about what that set me up for in the future, the people I met, the confidence I got, the validation too. Um, and I can, all, I can only imagine all the kids that do go there, how nerve wracking it is to commit to your dreams in that way. You know, you're paying money, you're going to class every day, all day. And it, it's, for me, it was an opportunity to put my money where my mouth is. Yes. You know, yeah. Yeah. and it's scary and it's thorough and, um, yeah, it set me up for all the things that came after that. But the thing I look back at the most was I just wanted to fucking be famous. I wanted I to be a movie star so bad and trying to not even dismantle it at that point. I was pretty shameless about the fact that I just wanted to be famous. And I wanted to talk to you about that. Like, you know, is that something you see often that kids come in and are just uh, like, I want to be famous? Um, to, to be honest, uh, and nobody compares to you. Like, um, <laughs> I, I, I'd never confronted a creature that was so dead set on being in the limelight, no matter what. Um, and from what I understand and remember, uh, you didn't really care what media it was. 
you just wanted that. You wanted that attention. You wanted that focus. And I, you were a, a, a big, a big learning lesson for me because I, I'm in it for the art. Um, uh, you know, I, I love VFS. It's a great school, um, but it's an institution and it does what it does really well. But for me, those moments of isolation in the classroom with the students, uh, doing the work, really digging deep into who we are as, as human beings, what we have to offer, what we need, um, what, what, what our conflicts are, uh, that kind of examination of the human journey is what really drives me. So you were the first person who admittedly and openly said, no, uh, that's all well and good, and I'll, I'll, I'll listen to you, and I'll, I'll receive the lessons, but be very clear, Bill Marchant, that I, Peter Breeze, want to be famous, end of story. <laughs> and, uh, I don't think I ever judged you. Uh, I know I didn't, actually, because I loved you from the get-go. You're, you're, you were always so warm and so charismatic, and even though your agenda was different from some of the other students, you were, you were, you were very honest and straightforward about it. So I had to readdress some of my feelings and thoughts about my own career, uh, my own relationship with fame, um, my own desires. And I, I had to admit that there was more Peter Breeze in me than I was willing to admit. And maybe in time, you've come to understand there's more Bill Marsh in you than you were originally. Oh, I'm getting goosebumps all over my body. I just feel like that's, it's, that's such a cool, it's so cool to hear what you were observing from me because the, the thing that I found the craziest was that I was the only one. I honestly thought everybody just wanted to be famous. And that's why, I mean, I did know people were passionate about acting and performing because I performed my entire life. But when I got to the class and I was vocal about wanting to be famous and I made that sort of the driving force behind everything that I did. And I saw other people reacting and like, you know, I can't believe you say that. Um, I, I, I sensed that I was different and that surprised me to be completely honest. When we would all go out and party and we were drinking and we were in the club, you know, that's when that side of people would come out like, oh, it'd be so fun to be famous. Peter, I love that energy. And I, I, I was surprised like how you were surprised I was that, I guess, shameless about it. I was surprised sitting in that room with my classmates that I was the only one. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think if they, well, as you said, when, when the liquor starts flowing or the, you know, the drugs have been taken and, and people's inhibitions are down, I think they're a lot more inclined to admit that, yes, that they may indeed love the art of acting, but everybody in their core you know, wants to be Daniel Day-Lewis and Meryl Streep, right? Like, uh, or, or, um, I don't know. Who, who, Paris like, Hilton. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Or Kim Kardashian, you know, like yeah. any, anything for the, for the, the, the spotlight, anything for that, that moment of, uh, of just of recognition and validation from the world at large. And, you know, I've been in the business for 44 years now and, that was really important to me when I was young, secretly maybe. Um, but yeah, I did. I, w I wanted to be, you know, um, Robert Redford, you know, I wanted to be um, Marlon Brando, oh, my God, you know, like just, and at 56 years old, I couldn't give a flying fuck. It, it, it means nothing to me. Um, I, I would still love to get my own series. I would still love to make a lot of money. Um, but I'm, a, I'm an introvert by nature, so the, the whole fame thing has lost all its luster for me. I don't, I would, I haven't had much fame, but I, I've definitely, I'm a, I'm a big fish in a little pond here in Vancouver, because people may think Vancouver is a big city, but it's not, it's, it's, it's so small. And uh, so there's a lot of people who know me here, and more than I'm comfortable with, to be honest. And every once in a while, I get, I get somebody who stops me because they saw me on Supernatural or The 100 or Stargate or whatever. And I used to think that would be fantastic to, you know, to sign an autograph or to have my picture taken or just to be recognized. And it's a huge, huge pain in the ass. I hate <laughs> I, I, I like being at home with my dog and my husband, um, and I like doing the acting work, and I like doing the teaching work, and of course I love writing, 
but uh, yeah, if, if fame ever held, had any appeal for me, it's pretty much gone by now. How about you? I, I, well, I, 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 okay, so I have separated definitely from it. Falling in love, meeting Evan, relieved a lot of my desperation for um, attention and to be validated. So when I met him and I was like, oh, maybe I don't need that. That was a huge shift for me. But then also realizing that I am a person that people like and I can cultivate that kind of experience without being on TV and being in tabloids. Um, the confidence I feel like when I was young, I had this really strong sense of who I was and who I wanted to be. And because I saw people on TV that were sharing their message that everybody looked at, I interpreted my path in life was supposed to be famous. Now that I sort of am on the other side of that, I mean, obviously I would not say no to a reality show. I, I have a podcast, like it, it's still in me, but what I've accepted about myself is my, my path and my passion and my purpose isn't to be a star, it's to let that energy out in whatever way it happens to manifest at any given time. I've done music, I did get booked in a few movies, now I'm doing a podcast and I don't think about fame the way I used to, but I have to respect the fact that there's something about my spirit and my personality that demands to be heard and seen <laughs> all the time. Yes, yeah, well, I. I could be wrong, but you are, are you an extrovert? Would you, would you call yourself that? I feel like, I don't know. I get confused about this because now I am a homebody, but I think that has to do with me putting so much emphasis on um, drinking and drugs when I was in my twenties. I don't do that anymore. And so unraveling from that made me more comfortable at home. And so I'm like, Oh, surprise. I'm an introvert. But when I go out, I turn it on and I become a showman. So I, I don't know. I'm comfortable at home, more comfortable than I ever have been. Cause you know, when I met you initially, I slept with the TV on, people were always at my house. I could not be alone. Now my chosen state is to be alone, walk my dog, get coffee. And then every once in a while I'll crave going out, being crazy within moderation now. Right. Um, so I, I don't know the answer to that. When I first stopped drinking, I said, I, I'm surprised that I'm an introvert. But then the longer I am with that inner peace and clarity, I'm like, no, I still like to be out there and seen and heard and engaged. I, I, I get that from the classroom. Uh, I get plenty of energy and love and attention. Um, and maybe too much, you know. Um, it's, you, you, as a, as a, uh, as an actor, you know that we we put so much stock and faith in our teachers, and um, especially when we're young, we we, we need mentors, and uh, I do like that job, but that's enough social for me. Um, when my teaching day is done, the last thing I want to do is go out. Um, I, I, I just I, I think when I was younger, I did like you did. Um, alcohol, I was self medicating, obviously, and um, so I was I was. I, I liked alcohol because it got rid of my, my shyness and my awkwardness and my inhibitions. So I could be the life of the party too. Um, but, uh, but in the end, that's just not a healthy way to live. You can't hold on to a relationship. And uh, Matt and I have been together for 21 years now. Wow. Uh, wow. You know, um, which is fantastic. Um, but I, I, before I met Matt, I didn't, I didn't know that that life could exist for me. Uh, I did. I did go to the bars a lot and uh, and drank too much. And I was never a big drug taker, but I certainly have done my fair share. Uh, but yeah, just as the mystery of life unfolds, I find more and more that uh, intimacy, love, uh, communication, uh, those things are vital to me. Adulation. Love from people I don't even know means less and less. I think it's good I to hear that you, the longer you're around, the easier it gets to just be happy with who you are and what you have. Have you noticed any differences in the last, you know, you said when I first, when I came to VFS, you had never seen somebody that was shamelessly wanting to be famous in that way. Have you, has that changed? Like with social media becoming so important and reality shows, have you seen more kids come in who are 
in that vein where they're, they're they want to act but they just want to be famous uh, <clears throat> yes uh, after after you were there um, because that was a long time ago right like 14 years ago mm-hmm. and since then of course YouTube has become much more of a, a phenomenon than it was back then so we do have students who come to school to be comfortable on camera so that they can go back to wherever they're from and do their own web series. We have quite a few alumni now who are very successful on the internet. <clears throat> wow. Not actors per se, but certainly performers. Cool. How, how then, yeah, go ahead. go ahead. No, you go. I, I, yeah, that's one of the things that I never really understood about the program, even though I'm partially responsible for creating it, is that uh, a sense of ease with the camera, uh, is a huge part of the education at VFS. I never got that education. I just designed it. So by the time students graduate from the school, they're much more camera savvy and much more uh, at ease in front of the intimidating cyclops that the lens is than I am. Uh, so whatever, you know, we have, we, we've, we have alumni who are in broadcasting, uh, certainly podcasting, certainly webcasting, uh, some big web series presence. So yes, you're, you were, you were sort of like a tidal wave before the, you know, the steady stream of students who came on who really wanted what you wanted. Yeah. That's good to know that I'm not the only one. That's why I started the podcast because I, I, I mean, I feel like my relationship with my dreams and pop culture ended up being a spiritual experience because it forced me to face myself and become who I am. And when you, put yourself out there to follow your dreams, to go to film school, to go in that path, you have to take the veil off at some point. And for me, that ended up, even though it was in the clubs, even though it was superficial, even though at times it was destructive, there was this beautiful quality and that, that, that reckless youth, you know, thing that, that pushes you to blossom and ends up being the base you know, it's not sustainable forever, but when I look back at that time, it was so, 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 so pivotal to my personal growth. And the the class that we had with you at the end of the term, where everybody gets that one-on-one with you and everybody's terrified the whole term that it's coming. Um, I think I was the last person to go up with you and... You know, you, you just said some, you called me a magician, like, you know, you're like, you're a magician, you cast spells on people. And you just said some really beautiful things that may validated my dreams. Yes. But also just made me feel like I was seen and uh, that I wasn't just, you know, a gay club kid who wanted to be famous. Yes, I was that, but you, you gave me a sense of ownership over that. And I, it changed me. It made me more, more confident in a real way, not in a look at me way. And yeah, I thank you for that. It was, it was really important to me to, to have that time with you in front of people for somebody to say, you are that way. You're this crazy creature and fucking yes. Yeah. You know? Well, th- thank you for saying that, 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 uh, cause I don't, I, I mean, students are very, very kind and generous with me. Uh, I don't always get to hear those stories, especially so long after the fact. And I'd love to believe that I'm that positive influence in that room and that I do have kindness and compassion for every single person who walks through those doors. And I'm not there to judge their dreams or their desires. That's not, that's not my job. My job is to support and, and, and love and encourage people. And, and by encourage, I, I mean, the, the, the true definition of the word, which is, to offer courage, to give courage to other people like my teachers and mentors gave to me. And I, I wouldn't be able to stand in front of that classroom and pretend that I have anything to say or to offer to anyone without the love and support of the people that were, you know, uh, supportive of me when I was a young artist. So it's, it's very lovely and very heartwarming to hear that, Peter. Thank you very much. That's, that's very lovely. Of course. Uh, do you still do that? And in, in, is that still part of the program, that one-on-one time? It is still the, the, the hot seat work, you mean? The hot seat. Oh, my God, the yeah. hot seat, yes. Yeah, I, we still do it. Um, I, I did it for 14 years, and at the end of it, I was just burnt out for, you know, for, for, for your viewers. What the hot seat basically is, is 
you have a piece of text that one of your other classmates have written, um, quite often bearing their deepest, darkest secrets and really diving deep into their psyche and, and, and you know, maybe why they're so conflicted by this human experience. Um, and then, so you have this piece that you've gotten from another student, you've memorized, and then you're, for, you're, you're put in a position where you have to con confront all your obstacles and all your conflict and all the reasons why you can't say yes to the better part of yourself and to your, and to your ability to interact with other people. Um, so after 14 years of hearing just heartbreaking, <laughs> heart-wrenching, moving, devastating stories, I, I, I got a case of what they call compassion fatigue. And I just I stopped feeling uh, as much and I knew it was time for me to go. It wasn't that I didn't care. It wasn't that I didn't love the students, but something inside me wasn't as reactive to their suffering as it used to be. And that, that happens to anybody who's confronting, you know, people who are in stress. So for the acting teacher, uh, compassion fatigue is a real worry. Uh, so I, I got out of that about um, seven years ago. And now I teach scene study during an intensive for one week in, uh, in, in your year. So now if you went to the school, you would get me for one full week working on a scene that you've rehearsed and developed with your partner. And then for one, for, for five grueling days for 12 hours a day, we just work those scenes hard, hard, hard. And uh, I love it. Uh, it. I only do it every, every eight weeks because it's exhausting. Um, but uh, it's so, it's so fun. So rewarding. So so fulfilling. You've seen a lot of kids graduate by now. And I'm wondering, there's a lot of success stories. There's a lot of kids who maybe go in different directions. One of the first things I was told at VFS when we had our big class meeting is less than 1% of people will become working actors. Oh, and I yep. Yeah. I remember thinking that and being like, well, they're obviously not talking about me because that's not going to happen. And when you graduate, the reality is very different because in film school, you're in this, this microcosm of working. You're constantly working the craft. You're, you're inspired. There's things to keep you engaged. And then when you graduate, you're kind of left to take the journey to the next level. And I'm wondering, based on what you've seen from kids graduating over the years, what do you think is most important for kids once they leave school and they go and they pursue their agent and they start auditioning? Tips, um, mind frames, practices that separate the people who go the distance and the people who maybe are not able to. Um. It's funny, this, this brings me back to you, because I think, I, I don't know where it comes from, it's different for everybody, but just sheer blind ambition uh, is probably the greatest tool an actor can have. It can also be their Achilles heel, because if you don't take care of your, yourself and your soul and uh, your relationships with other people, you're gonna be lost and lonely, but that's not my job to like to, to judge that either, right? If if you're a really ambitious person and you just want it bad, um, there's a very good chance that you're going to get it in some version. Some yep. some way. Yep. It, it may not come with the face that you expected on it, but it uh, if if you're that if you're that hungry for it, uh, it will come in in time. Um, I think I don't think I don't think many students are prepared for how much work it takes beyond the ambition though. And, you know, I, I, I know you hustled your ass off after school and success came in, in, in various forms and, 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 and faces, uh, but you, you earned it. So, so you, blind ambition is one thing, hard work is another thing. And then of course you and I both know that pure dumb luck is probably 90% of it. Uh, getting the right agent at the right time, if you can get an agent. I mean, you can be tall, short, fat, thin. You can be beautiful. You can be Quasimodo. It makes no difference uh, in the end. Uh, uh, hard work, ambition, and a whole lot of luck makes for a career. 
I know, I know hundreds of really talented people who are also fairly ambitious, who are still struggling after, you know, 10, 20, 30 years, and they stick to it because they love it. But you're right, probably somewhere between 60 and 80% of people fall away completely. Yeah, there's a lot that sort of is out of your control. And when I was, if, if, if I could go back in time, I probably would have forced myself to just be a little bit more structured because I did hustle. I did get a lot of great opportunities. But yeah, that discipline, it requires like to be a creative and to be an artist requires discipline if you want to turn it into a job. And it's different for everyone. Structure looks different for everybody. But you're also at the mercy of an ever evolving industry. Like when I was in film school, there was no gay roles. There was no gay roles. And yeah. then I was an assistant There's at a talent no, agent. Still no gay roles. Not many. Right. Not yeah. many. And they give them to straight people. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. I know. Yeah. yeah, it's crazy. And, you, you know, there's there's so many different variables that go into getting an agent and then getting booked. Um, you know, followings on social media now have an impact. And the the rate at which the industry changes is is unfathomable. Like now when I look, so when I look at these shows on TV and there's trans people and there's people in wheelchairs and sometimes I'm like, holy shit, how did that happen so fast? But then when you said it's been 14 years since I've been in film, I'm like, you know, it's not actually that fast, but you know, that's other, that's also a huge part of somebody's success. You know, what is the industry looking for at any given time? And how do you keep yourself engaged when you're not what the industry wants? You know, do you have any advice on that when you can't get an agent, the audition, or maybe you have an agent, but it's slow in auditions. What can people do to keep that electricity alive? Mm. Again, that's where the discipline comes in. Uh, you, because my next gig could be tomorrow or theoretically, I might never work again. So the only person who has any control over that is me. If, if I have a blank piece of paper in front of me, then I can write a scene, I can write a play, I can write a movie. Uh, and then I have to do the hard work of finding money to get it produced and done. But any, any actor who whines about not being able to do the work is lying to themselves because there's, there's always opportunity. Now it might be independent cinema or community theater or stand-up comedy or a podcast. Uh, there are so many, and like with, with YouTube and even TikTok, for God's sakes, there's, mm -hmm. so, there's so many places to put yourself out there that anybody who's whining and complaining about it is missing the point. It's not about waiting for the golden wand from Hollywood to tap you on the fucking head. It's, it's, about, it's about doing the goddamn work. And uh, uh, this, in, in my experience, the students who have been the most successful over time are the ones who've done the work uh, and stayed the course too. Yeah, not giving up and, and trusting your, your talent and your ambition that it will manifest in some way. Like you said, it might not be exactly how, how it, you thought it would look. You know, not everybody's going to be or can be Meryl Streep and Brad Pitt. That's the other thing, you know, there's these self-help books called like The Secret. I don't know if you're familiar with the manifesting your destiny and think, you know, think rich, be rich, that kind of thing. And there's a lot of people who, you know, can everybody be a movie star when it comes down to it? Is there enough, can everybody's dreams come true? I don't know. I mean, I certainly believe so. And I certainly believe that if you believe in yourself and if you are disciplined and you commit to it, you will find a place in the world that is just for you. But you have to have that self-belief first. And some people, like, I don't know where mine came from. I just, I, I believed in myself. I still do, but not everybody does. And I think that makes a huge difference too, is, is just believing ultimately that you can get there. Oh, it's all you've got, Peter. It's, it's the, it's, it's the only thing. Uh, I, I feel like the best, I, I know a lot about acting and I can teach a class with my eyes closed, but I think what I have to offer anybody is just a modicum of confidence. And we can all afford to be more confident. Most of the reasons that we're not confident come from our background, our, our parents, our, our, our siblings, 
our friends, our, our grade school teachers, God help them. They, they've planted a lot of, with the best intentions, they've planted a lot of doubt and insecurity in us that interferes with our ability to be successful. Because to be successful, you have to say, I have value, I have worth, uh, I have a story that needs to be told. And if you don't, if you don't have confidence in those areas, you're, you're going to be lost at sea for the rest of your life. And most people think that confidence is something that is like, it's a, it's a trait that you're born with. I don't think that's true. I think it comes from nurturing and love. Uh, I mean, you've been in love for a long time now, and I'm sure your, your sense of self and, and who you are as a man and a human being on planet earth has increased a thousand fold from that relationship. And that's why I think, uh, you know, sort of the subtext of, of, of film school or any good acting school is love. love. Love for yourself, respect for yourself, love and respect for other people, and certainly love and respect for the relationships that we have in life, because without them, we have nothing. And, and I think that was something that I, I wanted. I don't, know, I don't know if you would remember better than me, but that's something that I wanted to communicate to you when you were at school, that as much as I respected and appreciated your, your, your mad desire for the flame, uh, I, I also wanted you to know and understand that you were a lovely man on your own and you didn't need to have the adulation of the, the public to, to feel valuable. Yes, I, I remember feeling that message from you and it took a while for me to, for that to settle. Like, you know, going, graduating film school, diving deep into the club scene and doing music and, and just going at a million miles an hour to get whatever I could get my hands on and just fucking swallow it whole. Like I, I just, there was no thinking. It was all impulse, all impulse. And now I think the inner peace comes from the love and, and love from Evan. Yeah. I love from the people who support me, but I think there was a whole, there was a piece missing and it was the self-love part of the part of me that, um, that felt like I needed to be bigger than I was in order for myself to be, to be worth something. And yeah, I did in film school. That's when the, I felt like the uh, seed was planted that I was valuable. And then it took a couple of years for that to settle. But yeah, I think that's why people like you and people like me eventually can let go of the rock star fantasy because, you know, first of all, how many people become icons and say, I love that there's paparazzi outside my house. I love that I can't trust anyone in my life. I love that everybody screws me over. Look at what's happening with Britney. I mean, nobody gets that pinnacle of success and says, oh, thank God I can't leave my house. You know, so in some, I mean, if I would have become the star that I wanted to be in my 20s, I would be dead 100%. There was no stop. I was just no. like, go, 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 go. So, I yeah, mean, I, I think. I, I, I did worry about you for sure. Because, um, I, 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 yeah, you liked the party scene a little too much. And um, to, be, to, be, to be dead honest, um, yeah, I've, I've, I, there's probably 10, 20, 30, 50, 100, I don't know a lot of students over the course of my career that, uh, that I've worried about. And I hate to say it, but uh, too many that I've lost. Um, I knock on wood, it isn't that many, but even this year with COVID, uh, I've lost, I don't know, six, seven alumni from uh, everything from drug overdoses to, to bizarre accidents to, I'm uh, sorry, just check my dog here. You okay, buddy? You okay? Yeah. Um, uh, to suicide. So, um, you know, COVID is strange times. People are under terrible pressure. But, um, you know, fragile people, uh, they, they, they find it hard to survive this kind of environment that we're in right now. I, I find it hard. I mean, it, it's kind of a, a kind of a left turn there. But, um, yeah, um, to tie the two things together, if my job isn't to give confidence, then I don't know what it is because I know that every student who leaves, whether they become famous or whether they, they end up becoming a, a manager at Walmart, uh, they're still going to confront all kinds of just madness and insanity and terrible, terrible grief 
over the course of a lifetime, like we all do. And whatever skills I can offer to help prepare them for that, that's really what my job is. It's not, it's, yes, yes, you need to know how to, you know, do text analysis and break down a scene and how to rehearse and how to partner and how to be impulsive in the moment. All those things that are crucial to an actor's success. But ultimately, if you don't have, uh, if you, if you don't have some, some mental spiritual health at the center of it, you're in terrible, terrible danger. Yeah, the spiritual and part the spiritual for me part has part been huge. Um, do you consider yourself spiritual? Um, wow, that's a really good question. I'm certainly <laughs> not a religious person, um, and I'm married to uh, um, an atheist. But yes, I would call myself a spiritual person, if, if only meaning that the, the human spirit itself is something that needs to be nurtured and protected and developed and um, and, and, and taken care of so that it can flourish and grow. Um, I, think, I, I think too, this is something that I learned over the course of being an educator and an artist is that, and, and as a recovering Christian for that matter, but um, it's true, it's true. I, you know, I'm, I'm not into Jesus, but I'm into his message big time, which is love everybody. And I do, I love everybody. I don't, you know, students sometimes say to me, well, you can't love everybody. And I'm like, well, would you rather me have le love less people? Uh, why, why would I? Why, why would I not love everybody? It's it, it, that's that's the human journey to me is is to have love and compassion for all creatures. So yes, I'm a spiritual person. Yeah. Yeah. One yeah. one thing that I'm discovering is um, like saying spiritual or saying religious or talking about God sometimes gives people like they get prickly and they're like, eh, eh, eh. but if you focus on what somebody is feeling and experiencing, like the way that you talk about working with your students and the way that it affects you and the way that you see them as, you know, being these love-based beings that need to give and share love. To me, that is what spirituality is, the exchange of love, right? And so we could have never said, are you spiritual, are you not? We don't need to put that stamp on it, but that that is ultimately what it comes down to. And I think you're a great example of, Nobody needs to ever ask you if you're spiritual because if they're around you and if they get to go to your class, it's obvious. And I think that's a great example of, you know, somebody just focusing on love. How do they exchange authentically and letting that be the message? You don't have to read the Bible. I agree with you. Jesus had a great message, accept love, but it comes down to, you know, you can take spirituality out of it. You can take religion out of it. You can take all those words that have all this weight and just be like, man, I just want to love. I want to love you. I want to love you. I want to love everyone. Everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you froze, you froze a bit there for a second. I got you though. Um, I was going to say to you, um, when I first met you, now granted you were a very, very young man. You were what, 19, maybe 20? Yeah, 1920. Yeah. And when you first started the program, it wasn't that you weren't a nice person, um, but you were, you were cynical, uh, sarcastic, certainly. Uh, and sometimes a little, a, a, a little bit judgmental of, of of some of your peers. And if I'm if I'm remembering this right, over the course of the year, that shifted and changed completely. Like there was something almost icy about you at times when you first started the program. Like you had, like there was a veneer or a mask or a shield or armor that was quite cold. That not like not and again not in a really not in a mean way or a or toxic way, but anyway, you, you, it, was, it was like you were in a, a, a cocoon and, uh, and you were safe and happy there and that seemed to change over the course of the program and, and over the course of the, and the years following. I mean, I have, we haven't had a lot of contact, but I would see you now and again and you were certainly, you were certainly much more bright, loving and open and playful as, as our, and, and you continue to be so like, I still recognize you as the Peter Breeze that I, I, I met that, that day so long ago. Um, you're still the same lovely creature, but you've obviously, you've grown, you've developed, you've matured, you've deepened. Um, do, do, you, do you remember that transformation? I do. I, do. I think it comes down to, um, 
You know, I got this tattoo when I, it was before I started film school, Untouchable, because when I was high on mushrooms in Calgary before I moved to Vancouver, I was like, you know, there is nothing that anybody can ever do to take away whatever it is that I have inside, my spirit, my confidence, my ambition. And so when I went out into the world, I... I did not leave any room for people to tell me anything other than what I wanted to hear. And so going to film school, I had to go there and leave knowing that I was a star because that was how I based my entire life. That was my whole identity. And if I couldn't convince people in a classroom, then how the fuck was I going to convince anybody in the real world? So I think the process of, of cracking away that dream and letting, letting myself be the wide range of who I am, you know, I am that I can be that icy person still, but I think I was, it's funny how wanting to be a big superstar feels like a big, huge dream. But when I look back, I was putting myself in such a small little box of what I was allowing people to see. And film school was when I first started opening up and softening and making connections, exploring my sexuality in like, not what it means to have sex with a man, but like owning who you are without being a cartoon character, you know? Now you were an out queer man when, when, before you came to the school, correct? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which in those days was, that, that itself was radical. I mean, it, it's, it's only 14 years ago, but as you said, so much has changed in 14 years. And I, I don't know if I felt this about you specifically, but um, you know, I'm, I'm 20 years older than you at least. I, I don't know. How old are you now? 34. 34. I'm 56. So yeah, I'm 22 years older than you. And that 22 years makes a massive difference because when I was in high school, certainly growing up in small town, Ontario, there was, there was no way for me to come out. It was, it was impossible. It would have been, it would have been dangerous to come out. Um, maybe I'm exaggerating it, but I don't think that I am. So, you know, one of the great things about my job is that my students who are much more advanced in terms of their positivity about, about their queerness taught me to have love and respect for myself completely and fully. So I, you know, I was out before I met you, um, but I, I still swear I'm, I, 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 I still swear I'm in the coming out process because uh, I still have internalized homophobia uh, I, I still I still balk at certain members of the, of the queer community internally. Of course, I, I accept everybody, but there's old fears and old inhibitions and old you know very old demons that tell me that I'm worth less because I'm queer. And somebody like you striding into my classroom, so flamboyant, so playful, so unapologetically gay. Uh, that that really you you gave me courage too you know like it, it works both ways. I'm so glad to hear that. That's what they used to write about me in Extra West all the time. Peter Breeze, unapologetically gay, shamelessly gay, and I was like, I'm just you know yeah I got disco balls on my feet, but I'm that's just who I am. <laughs> disco balls on your feet. Yeah, buy me a drink. Buy me a drink. Buy there me a drink. you go. Exactly. <laughs> That's a perfect way to wrap it up. I'm so happy that I got to talk to you today, Bill. Like, I, I, I still feel connected to you after all these years. And again, that year at VFS set me up for all of the amazing things that came after. Um, I was lucky that I did get booked in some movies. Um, I did a lot of stuff with my music and just fucking partied my face off. But I did get the fame that I was craving. I got it in a smaller way than I wanted. But I feel like VFS like my training wheels came off and it set me off. So thank you for sharing this hour with me. Um, it's yeah, great to see you. Already. The time went by. I like know. I know. Um, Peter, when you approached me to do this, um, uh, my heart leapt. I was so excited just, uh, of course, to do this, but more importantly, to connect with you again and, uh, and say, hello, you're, you know, like I, I do love you and uh, I'll never not love you. And uh, I, I, I know we have a, a specific distinct friendship but it's it's real and uh I'm, I'm very thankful for it thank you bill i feel the same way do you have anything any final thoughts you want to share with people to anybody out there whether you're 14 or 70 if if you've dreamed of expressing yourself as an artist 
writing, poetry, painting, music, dance, acting, whatever it might be. And if you haven't taken the opportunity to, to really indulge yourself, uh, you only have one life. And if there's a story inside you that you've got to tell, get it out, F find a way. It's never too late. I love that. Oh, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Bill. I hope that I get to see your face again soon. If I'm ever back in Vancouver, which I will be, we need to go for coffee. Uh, or yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Um, uh, um, I, I can't wait for you to come back. Cool. I'll see you soon. And thank you so much for, for being here. Oh, you're very, very welcome. Peace and love to you, Peter. Bye, Bill. Love you. Love you too. Bye. Oh, 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 oh,